Good afternoon, everyone. It is Robert Ridzak, host of the Deep Q cast, along with his compatriots, Matthew Reed and Carlos Zendejas, co-founders of Deep Q Digital, having their handy beverages in hand. Of course, it is happy hour over here at the Deep Q cast. And deep beverage, I, I love that. Yeah, and deep, deep in their beverages <laughs> as well. In hand. Yeah, I uh, I have a, a green tea because I am a new father of twins, and if I have a, an alcoholic beverage, I'm afraid I'm going to pass out on my microphone here. So, keeping it uh, keeping it caffeinated. I might uh, next week I might go switch up for a vodka Red Bull if I'm feeling Sprite, but this uh, this time it's just uh, just a green tea. What do, what do you guys got? I know uh, Carlos he has his champagne of beers over there. Uh, but, but it's, like, it's, it never fails. It's, that's the champagne and bills beers is Miller High Life. Oh this my god, Patriot this is water a, over here. <laughs> Patriot so, water, dude. That's why we talked I mean, about that. Yeah, let's get it. Yeah. Let's get it straight. Although I, I will say there was a, uh, we used to have a fun stat when we first started doing this. It was all nights and weekends, um, and we w- we'd like to sit around and estimate the number of lines in our code base that were written at least one beer deep, and I, I got estimated as at least probably eighty percent at one point in time. <laughs> My now, question, it's, now, my, it's like, now it's like 70. My, my question would be, okay, yeah, one beer deep. But what about, like, how, like, what's the tail? Does like fall off a cliff after, like, beer three or something? You, you know, know? I've, I've, actually, I've actually tested this, believe it or not. I think I code my best one to two beers deep. After that, don't try. Don't try. Same, like an same, also goes, same also goes with working out. Like, you know, if you try and hit the gym one to two beers deep, I think it's doable. It's doable, but after that, I mean, honestly, after that, I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> after, it sounds like an, I'm an alcoholic. I think the, the correct answer is I used to work on Wall Street, and you always have this like perpetual. You know, you get invited out to drinks with like clients or coworkers, and then you still want to make it to the gym, and so it'd always be like, oh, I can have one beer and then go to the gym. <laughs> and you know, fortunately, only only a very small handful of time has the gym attendant tapped me on the shoulder politely and said, "Excuse me, sir." You're running very haphazardly. I think you should get off the treadmill. <laughs> I, I know I get I enter a paradigm shift when uh, psychologically whenever I uh, I hear that the frothy froth leave the can I'm like okay I'm done no workouts for me yeah oh, I've I've since repented of my ways I think once the, the minute a beer cracks I'm done for the day so <laughs> Matt what you got uh, it is rhythm and blue. The Pilsner from Connecticut, very good. Pilsner, you know, you've been very on a chilled. stout streak. I feel like the past past couple episodes. What happened? Yeah, I've got to go something lighter after Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> it's like cut down, man. This is dude. my uh, detox beer. Yeah. I love it. Dry well, January. Just, Congrats, everyone. Yeah, I just uh, I feel like with uh, with kids at home, all I'm eating is uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches now over here. It's basically like all, like what the four, all four food groups: bread, peanut butter, and jelly, some milk. Just wait for your toddlers because that that will fully be your diet. <laughs> I'm getting prepped, so it's all right. Yeah, so it's a training period, guys. Um, things that news has started picking up a little bit. Uh, maybe we can dive into some of the the week's activities. I um, like you know just saw news come out recently around SEC charging Gemini and Genesis, which I know that kind of had been. Uh, I feel like the sharks were circling around that. So, I don't know. I wasn't uh, super surprised to hear about that news that just came out. Maybe if you guys want to talk about it, I know that I think that just came out yesterday. Um, maybe we want to yeah. touch on that a little bit since that's most most current current news yeah, out I, there. I mean, like you said, it's not a complete surprise. Um, BlockFi had a similar case against them last year. Uh, I think it cost them $100 million to settle uh, for their earned program. So... And we were talking about this earlier with Coinbase kind of being told not to by the SEC to offer an earn program, uh, which looks like that was actually the right move. Um, and I'm surprised they received such forward guidance because that's somewhat, at least in my experience, not usually how things go with the SEC. It's like you will... <laughs> better to ask for forgiveness after it's almost the case because they just don't tell you what front if you're doing the wrong thing and um, for all of our um and for all of our uh non-british speakers sec is the sec in america <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah very good likewise uh, if you hear him use the term beta it's actually beta <laughs> love it shall we go on <laughs> tomato 
Yeah, I was, I was, I, I know, it's kind of funny. It's just like uh, Gary Gensler kicking them and they're down. They're like, okay, cool. Everyone hates you now. Okay, now we can go ahead and just lay yeah, the gauntlet so, down. I mean, I, I do feel for them a little bit because um, I mean, they're regulated in New York, but they have <laughs> been told that that um, programming classifies as a security. So now the SEC are like all, all over that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it it's tough, tough for them. Like it won't impact the re return for people that are on the on the hook for it. Um, like the people that invested in the own program won't make any difference to that, but it does obviously a fine for Gemini, which, uh, I think so they seems they've at least tried to do the right thing and get feedback from the regulators and have not had that, uh, all the, all the way. I, I have a couple problems with this. So first and foremost, um, they knew that this thing was going on like 18 months, right? It's not like it was like, Oh shit, we just found out about it and now we're going to have some enforcement. They knew it was going on for 18 months. You go to Gemini's website, it's fully on the front page. Like you cannot escape it. And you know, at the same time that Gary Gensler was meeting with his boy SBF and letting all sorts of crazy shit fly under the radar, now he's deflecting by saying, "Oh, you know what? Like let's just go after these guys while they're down. We've done nothing to protect anybody from any actual, you know, wrongdoing. The time to have stepped in on this was 18 months ago or at a minimum 12 months ago after you've had some time to take a look at it. From what I understand, Gemini had made the regulators fully aware of what was going on. Uh I think you you double that with the fact that Gary Gensler chose to announce it by making a fucking TikTok video. Um, I mean, it just <laughs> so seriously, it just looks it looks like he's trying to become a social media star and be like, "Hey guys, I went after the Kardashians and now I'm going after the Winklevoss twins." It's just it just screams to me like you know a guy who's above his skis a little bit and kind of doesn't know what he's doing. Like he could have gotten ahead of this months and months and months ago. I, I can it to be like you're in a public venue and there's some kind of tussle and security is escorting one of the people out of the room and a guy comes and punches you in the back of the head. That's, that's, that's you can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, seriously, they, they, they've done absolutely nothing to protect investors in this scenario. It's like, right, like name, name me what public good is coming as a result of this. Nothing other than Gary Gensler gets to like up his social media view count. Absolutely. Right. So. I mean, that's really what, like, I don't, like, the, I don't think that the, S well, here, I have a question for you. Do you think the SEC ever really, SEC never really wanted them to have that program to begin with, right? So, like, do you th obviously politics play, play a lot into this. Um, we kind of touched on this before, but, you know, politics are important and they didn't really have as much of a popular opinion around them. It was just an easy, like it was, they probably, they, they may have wanted to do this for a while, but maybe they didn't feel like they had enough support to be able to get away with it. And now public opinion may have waned and they can feel like they can do what they would have wanted to do 12 months ago. Well, but I think it's that well, still, re that still represents kind of... just total spineless behavior by the regulator yeah. though, right? Like yeah. you don't want that. It's like, oh, well, now I can because the pub, fuck that. Do it when it's yeah. the right thing to do. Yeah, it's about providing better forward guidance on this stuff as well. I mean, that is, that is true. I think that the thing that's probably the most disconcerting for the market on the whole is that the SEC now has a pattern of regulation by enforcement. And we've used that term before, but I want to like highlight that. It's like exactly what that means to people who are you know following along. Regulation by enforcement means exactly that you refuse to give actual guidance on what the laws are. So rather than giving upfront guidance on what the laws are, you look after the fact, and then you impose new regulation by suing people and letting the courts figure it out. So to me, that's just really the most spineless way of doing it. You've got an industry that is absolutely begging, right? The number of times that Coinbase and Gemini and Kraken for, you know, for all it's worth have claimed to have attempted to meet with the SEC and gotten no regulatory guidance on, you know, how things uh, are intended to be is really shameful. And what does that do? Well, it pushes things offshore to, you know, these uh, guys like Binance and FTX. So you can't, as a regulator, complain about how these unregulated shadow banks exist out in the wild offshore. 
when you failed to give regulatory clarity to U.S.-based entities that wanted to do it correctly. The only thing that you're doing is you're burdening people that are trying to do it the right the right way, and you're making it such that U.S. entities can't be competitive, and it shifts all the business over to unregulated foreign entities. So to me, this is just absolutely shameful on so many levels. But first and foremost, it's taking away from the U.S.'s ability to be a thought leader and an industry sort of uh, best in class for the crypto world. Yeah, I mean, it's but it's it's shameless, but it's not it's not unexpected. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, as you can tell, I feel very strongly about Gary Gensler. <laughs> Man, yeah, he's my, he's my homie. He just followed yeah. me on Twitter. <laughs> he's just trying to scoop up some some more intel. Yeah, we're gonna. We're, I'm gonna teach him the the latest dance so we can get some more TikTok views. It's like what's what's high frequency trading? Sorry, <laughs> hold, on, hold on a second, <laughs> real quick. What's can a big one with this? Yeah, what, what is this high frequency trading? Buy sell. Speaking of uh, speaking of high frequency trading, Citadel came in with some of their performance figures. I think was Citadel Securities posted something like seven point five billion dollars in revenue. Citadel yeah, posted twenty eight billion dollars. <laughs> what the, the hell are they doing have over there? Crushed it, haven't they? Absolutely crushed it. Yeah turn like just find rocks and sell them as stones i don't know so here's the funny thing about citadel i mean let's talk about regulatory oversight here you've got a guy ken griffin that's donated about as much money to the republicans as sbf donated to the democrats um you've got a securities business which primarily deals off of this I'm going to call it an ethical gray area of payment for order flow, um, which I don't know, Matt, do you, can, can you just give a quick overview of what payment for order flow is? Cause I don't think I can give an unbiased view on, on the matter. I'm going to come in and I'm going to make it sound like the most villainous evil shit on the planet. So it's probably better that Matt gets a, true unbiased a, opinion. Sense of, a sensible, <laughs> a sensible idea of what payment for order flow is. Matt because, Redesign. Spoiler alert. Carlos does not think it's cool. <laughs> Matt Reed is uh, Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, payment for order flow. I mean, it's, it's kind of that. Uh, it's in the name, in, es in essence. So a market maker can pay a brokerage firm, such as like Robinhood, is the classic one we all know and love now, for flow that they receive. Now the deal there on the brokerage side is that you have to make sure you've covered best execution practices because. Ideally, if you only have one dealer in, that could be Citadel, and they, you know, paying for the flow could be argued as a, a conflict of interest. There, you're getting paid to send the flow to them, and then you're not guaranteeing a, a reasonable price for the consumer at the at the end of the day. So the person that actually wants to make the trade, and the brokerage is I goal is basically they'll, normally they charge some fee, and then they pass it through to market makers on the other side that they could match off with. Um, so like brokerages are kind of like, uh, you know, exchanges in a way, um, uh, they'll take fees and they'll match you up, uh, especially OTC with a, with a counterparty. Uh, and yeah, payment for order flow is where those market makers on the other end can pay for certain types of flow that they want. And, um, the retail sector is a very in demand space cause it's generally, you know, you could be on your app now just going, yeah, let's buy some Apple generally going to be very agnostic to anything else that's happening in the market. So the flow Matt, is pretty Matt, benign. When someone term. says fancy buying some Apple, what does that mean? I fancy buying some Apple stock, not like literally apples. I mean, Apple stock. Although uh, they are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just making, I'm making fun of your Britishisms because um, I, I fancy it. stuff as well. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so that, that's kind of what it is. Um, so and like I said, so under FINRA, there's rules about ensuring you do best execution and both like a brokerage, uh, broker dealer is on the hook for that. So I, let me jump in then with what I think are some problems with payment for order flow. Uh, typically the, um, payment for order flow benchmark for best execution is, uh, what's called the national best bid and offer. Yeah. Uh, which the government maintains and the government 
has, if you think that like, for example, high frequency firms have like best in class architecture, and then banks have something like right here, um, government architecture is literally down in the depths of hell. So what ends up happening is that the national best bid and offer happens at time scales, which are not even close to being representative to what the true market is. So it's actually really easy to game that. And it's really easy to show that you improved on the best bid and offer on some lit venue, right? When in actuality, the real market across all the different places that they see could be like fantastically worse or better somewhere away. And typically so, this is really inequities we're talking about. Yes. This yes, and like, this uh, all this all exists as an artifact of regulators causing unintended consequences. This doesn't happen in any other um, any other marketplace because every other marketplace just has general competition. Where if you want the best price, you get n number of counterparties in, and they compete on price. <laughs> so because the regulator has this concept of a national best bid and offer, which it's deluded itself into believing as a proxy for a competitive price in the market at a time scale that's relevant. Um, guys like Citadel basically get to come in and, you know, it, in high frequency time structures, it would be like if you got to get the newspaper at the end of the day and get the high and low price and get to deal in between those. Right. <laughs> So like if you were if you were to go intraday and basically charge the high and low of the day is your bid offer, that's effectively what Citadel gets to do for its equities electronic market making. And in order to make sure it has no competition with these retail vendors, it basically locks it in for some small venue. And then, you know, retail people go to Robinhood and they're like, Oh great, no fees. I'm getting such a great deal here. Well, no, what's the Robinhood still needs to make money. And the way Robinhood makes money is it sells that order flow to people like Citadel so that they can rip your face off. And all that's legal. It's great. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's all legal because, you know, like I said, I think you've, you've got this regulatory capture where you've got people that you're like Gary Gensler, who's like, Hey, what's what's an HFT? I, I don't know. Well, Sounds that's good the to thing. Me. So I thought at the start middle of this year that he was going to go after that, but then it seems to have like all fizzled out. I haven't heard anything else on it. Is he, is he just done? Like, <laughs> he should write all that. He's found, a, he's found a new red herring in Gemini Urn to distract <laughs> everybody. <laughs> he's like, guys, hold on. I'm totally protecting you. To see that guy on the ground who was writhing yeah. in agony? I kicked him. <laughs> You're all Twice. safe now. Twice. Yeah. <laughs> right in the nuts. <laughs> So, I, it's, it's, it's all performative and it's all theater. I, I mean, that's, that's why I don't believe that in, in actuality, right, dealing with uh, retail flow um, on payment for order flow should generate $7.5 billion in, in revenue. Like, that's absolutely insane to me. I mean, yeah, I, it, they should be a billion dollar business, maybe a couple hundred million. I, I don't see a world where they're actually generating $7.5 billion in revenue or profits for that matter, on their securities business, um, unless they're doing something a little untoward. So, I mean, uh, what, so basically, like, if I was to summarize, the issues around all of this is that there's regulations which may have, may or may not, probably had some, some good intentions trying to create better price transparency, better pricing for retail. The problem is, is that regulators are always two steps behind the, the market, and so they implement regulations which can end up being hurtful, harmful to uh, to, to to investors. Um, a question I had for both of you, and this is more because I, I I personally don't have the answer to this. How does how would this relate? You know, this paying for order flow is this something that we could possibly see with centralized U.S. crypto exchanges like on Coinbase and Kraken, or like how like is it or is that just totally is it just too nascent? And that's something that we, no, it's, we wouldn't know. It's a it's a total risk in my opinion. I think. Um, I would like to believe that the market focuses on the best solution for everybody. And I think that if you have regulators that take steps to protect investors, but don't overly engineer stuff, right? Because the, the U.S. equities market really is a byproduct. If you look at U.S. treasuries, if you look at foreign exchange markets, um, you know, those are the two biggest 
markets in the world, and they actually operate pretty efficiently without a lot of sort of the centralized reporting and requirements that are imposed on the U.S. equities market. So if if crypto is allowed to, let, let's say, for example, there's no regulatory capture that says you must uh, have this national best bid and offer and you must report all things properly. What would end up happening right, is that um, people would deal on exchanges. And if they had the choice between an exchange that did payment for order flow, an exchange that did not do payment for order flow, or for that matter, an over-the-counter op- you know, option with somebody that was a bilateral trading relationship, they'd look at all of those things and like, all right, where do, where do I get the best execution? And they'd deal on the payment for order flow site and they would be like, actually, you know what? Um, I might save myself a little bit on fees, but my total cost of, of dealing as measured by a number of things like, you know, post-trade market impact, you know, order slippage, all that sort of stuff is actually pretty terrible. Like it's absolute garbage. There must be somebody trading against me on the other end of that. And then they'd look at a general exchange. You're like, it's slightly better. I pay some fees, but you know, at the end it's run reasonably fairly. And I don't think that there's any one organization that's, you know, using some informational advantage on the back end to trade against my positions and drive them against me. Um, so that, that would end up being a better solution. So long as people have the ability to trade on either one. And then obviously they'd, they'd look at OTC and they'd be like, all right, well, that actually, if I have access to that and I've got credit lines and something like that, it's way cheaper. The spreads are tighter. And generally speaking, I know who I'm trading with. And so I know that they're not doing anything against me because I can always just hold them accountable. Mm-hmm. All of these things, like if you actually are in a market environment and the regulator's not saying, oh, well, actually, you know, this high frequency trading firm paid us a lot of money and donated a bunch. So we're actually going to shift the regulatory side such that it favors this exchange with payment for order flow, people will end up looking at it eventually and they'll say to themselves, well, you know, it's not really that great of an option. And those guys will just die off because it's a shitty market practice. So I'm hoping that that's the way that the crypto market goes. Um, But it is a fear of mine that the market Mm -hmm. devolves into a lot of these centralized exchanges realizing that an easy way for them to make money is to make sort of these backroom deals with high frequency market makers that do shitty stuff. What do you think one of the nice things is that currently all those exchanges are very accessible. So you can actually get a pretty good idea of what mid is. Um, that's actually a lot harder in like other securities to do. Well, sorry, securities markets up front are not open to everyone. Um, and then the, the issue is like, how do you know you're getting best execution? Like, okay, you've got the NBBO, but as you said, that could be lagged, could be wrong. And then where are they getting their information from that makes them be able to monetize it? Well, other exchanges, which we don't have access to type of thing. So uh, I think it's one of the nice things is that if something like that did happen in crypto, you'd be able to spot it, I think, pretty quickly. Yeah. I think one of the one of the biggest indicators, just from like a technical level that everyone should watch for, is right now I think one of the beautiful things about the crypto market is that the majority of price discovery happens on Amazon Web Services. And people could no, I'm dead serious. Yeah, it's amazing. Because the centralized exchanges, the way that they work is there's a data center somewhere in New Jersey or London or, you know, Hong Kong or Singapore. And the exchange has servers and they rent out um, places next to everybody. So the barrier to entry to get access is like a million a year to rent out a server next to these places. Then they have like super, you know, fast copper wire connecting them so that they can like communicate sub microseconds. So if you're not in that club, if you're not part of the million dollar a year plus club where you pay for that infrastructure, then there's no way that you have an edge over short time scales, just, just fuck you, right? You're done. So if you have all of these exchanges right now have said, we want to have a fair ecosystem. So let's do this on Amazon web services. Now, in some ways that's terrible because a traditional market maker is like, oh man, that's like 10 milliseconds latency. That's so slow, but the playing field is level. Anyone can come in and subscribe to the API trade on it and the playing field's level. Citadel Securities doesn't have any extra advantage. They could be best friends with Jeff Bezos. There's no way they're getting better latency on Amazon Web Services because in some ways it's randomized and you know you just you have to go through several layers of virtualization to get to where you need to go. 
So it, that's one of the questions I had. So I mean, this may, I might be over over engineering it, but you have. So let's like, do we know that whether Amazon Web Services has certain data centers throughout the United States, and could someone like a Citadel set up like pods next to all of those Amazon Web Service yeah. data centers, so that yeah, I mean, they could to, still to, effectively have like a like an edge? Totally, but your 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 limit, you're never going to be able to physically pin right next to the server that's running the the matching engine because that's what it is right coinbase kraken are running a matching engine the chances of you actually getting the pc that's right next to that is very very small you might get one in the neighborhood and you can technically you can ping that to find out where change your pc each time within amazon and get close probably very expensive to keep doing that as well and time inefficient yeah probably be better off just trading but uh mm. you can try and hone in on where something is and look at your latencies to reduce them but what's that going to get you you're never going to be like directly next to the box and if you are that's by random chance it won't be there Correct. and even if let's say for example even if you manage to be randomly assigned in the server right next to it uh <clears throat> best way to think about it is there's several layers of virtualization on those servers that add extra latency. Um, cause when you rent a server from Amazon web services, they create what's called virtual servers. You're, you're typically not, you know, running bare metal on that box. So because of that, and there, there are going to be network people who are like, Carlos, you have no idea what you're talking about. And there are going to be people on the other end be like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm trying to keep this like middle of the road, but effectively, <laughs> Because of the way they run it, even if you randomly get lucky next to the and you get placed next to it, uh, you're still not going to be sub microsecond back and forth because there's several software layers in between you and their server. So, like it's like I said, you could be best friends with Jeff Bezos, and even if you're super lucky or you try a bunch of random things, like there's there's a, a floor, there's a limit to what you can actually do in terms of reducing your latency. So it's not an edge for anybody to have better latency. At least I've not yet heard of them offering services to pay to have. So Kraken would also have to agree, for instance, to pay to physically locate on a hard server that yeah. is always there all the time, which maybe they have. But then, yeah, I've not heard them offering something where you can, I want to be right next to that specific machine. Yeah. And as Carl so said, there's other layers that happen and, when they brought and, and to be network. fair i think like for example we've spoken with the guys over at kraken and the guys at kraken say like they are not going to do that as a matter yeah. of principle because they prefer to have a more democratic access to market data which i think that's a, a great feature of the market you might talk to some traditional hft guys who are like oh, i don't know how you can even trade and make money if you don't have this special advantage and, and the answer is like well be better um <laughs> I know, I know places like Jump, for example. They're 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 super big HFT, and they're they're pretty uh, um, big in the crypto space. I know, like on Solana, they were uh, um, in uh, in close partnership with FTX, for example. Like, how do the, like how do these guys even plan to make money? Because it sounds like it's just like the latency is so long that any like any speed edge that you have just gets totally decayed by the infrastructure of these exchanges. But the latency is the same for everyone. So, uh, like, it, it, you can still make your computers pretty fast. Like, don't get me wrong, you're, you're talking like mics, microseconds to do something. And then, so then as well, how much do people want to pay to get down to that level? But then the, all I'm saying is the initial latency is pretty much fixed. You can't physically get closer to like NY4, uh, which is a you know, hub in, the, in New York, or, who owns that NASDAQ? I forget. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, but uh, a trading hub and I could be based in <laughs> pick anywhere like your, downtown your, uh, your villa in St. Bart's. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I could pay, I could only afford to live in Manhattan and that's where I then connect to that box. Right. I could then try and get closer and closer to it, but uh, to reduce the latency, but there's an incremental cost every time you do it until as Carl said at the start, you're right next to the box, colo in with the server and you're in and it costs mm -hmm. very expensive to do so. At least with crypto, that initial barrier to entry has kind of been eradicated for yeah. now. Um, and then it's a matter of, well, okay. Yeah. Having faster, Machinery means you'll be able to get trades before someone else. Um, but then that's a question of, 
everyone has that constraint that that's a software problem as opposed to it being a, a hardware problem. Do you think of this reduces it? Like what's the, like, so um, I know I'm kind of digging into it. I think it's actually fascinating. I know it touches on a lot about what, what you guys do. Um, so because of that, that, that threshold that uh, that's created that infrastructure kind of that creates this like a little bit like higher latency, um, the costs for entrance into the market, maybe does it go from like tens of millions of dollars in, uh, in capitalization to be able to compete down to like just millions of dollars? Or like, what's the uh, what's the delta you feel like? Yeah, I'd, I'd say it takes it down by an order of magnitude. Um, if you think about what it costs to do a high frequency trading firm in uh, TradFi, you need to have capital to trade um, you know, in the tens of millions. You need to have uh, infrastructure, meaning like rent out physical, you know, locations across a number of different data centers across the world, each of which costs millions of dollars. And, and that's exactly, You're, it's rent. You're paying like rent yeah. to someone to have a space like it is rent. And then to top it all off, you need to have a very specific type of engineer, right? You can't just get a normal software engineer. You need like a, an engineer that knows networks. We're talking like understands the way that data flows, like, you know, material sciences, engineers, people that understand like microwave connectivity. You need people that understand extremely low level, you know, programming languages. You need people that understand what are called FPGAs, which we talked about last time, um, or like chips that are specific to just doing that, right? That the software component, the data analysis bit is really kind of like, yeah, well, whatever. Um, but there's a very specific skill set and a very small number of people in the world that do all of those things. And that's a, that's a huge up, you know, outlay of capital in order to get that in crypto, you need, you know, a fairly decent DevOps guy to set you up on Amazon web services, uh, in a, a meaningful way. You need to be able to store your data in a proper way. You still need to have performant code as Matt said. It's so like the infrastructure is kind of like a level playing field, but then once you get the data in, you still need to process that data and do stuff. So you typically probably wouldn't want to do that in just like vanilla Python. You know, you'd, you'd want to have some sort of, you know, performance enhanced or lower level programming language or at a minimum Cython or C++ or something along those lines to, to, to process that quickly. Cause that can matter, hmm. but, but really it's more of a, a software cloud engineering problem more so than needing to outlay all of that physical capital and renting of, you know, space and equipment. So it, it really does change the game for crypto. Oh, interesting. That's fascinating, guys. Thanks for explaining. Um, I know uh, we've, uh, I think we're already at 30 minutes or so in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the cast. Um, maybe jump over to, to macro roundup. Um, I know like uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum had a pretty sizable rally. Uh, seems like inflation seems to be coming in a little bit lighter than what people expected. I also saw the University of Michigan came out with their uh, inflation expectations, which uh, came in a, a lot, a lot softer than, uh, than expectations. Um, it seems like I, you know, to be honest, I remember that a year ago, we were talking as things were heating up on the inflation side, people were talking about the feds going to raise rates aggressively. And then by end of year, there's going to be growing expectations of a, of a fed pivot. Um, that seems to be playing out still. And it seems like it could be pretty, uh, pretty fruitful for the crypto market. If, uh, if, if uh, inflation does continue to come in under expectations. Yeah, I mean, I think we saw the start of that uh, play on our, yesterday and it's kind of continued a bit today. Um, like definitely a risk on across all asset classes yesterday, not just crypto. Um, yeah. I, I think for me, um, <clears throat> I think it's, we've seen this, we've seen this play before, right? Um, we get really amped up about news on the CPI front. Like this happened to us in October. It's happened to us like a couple of times where you get amped up. You're like, oh man, inflation's coming down. This is fantastic. And then the market rallies because there's nothing to stop it. And then suddenly you get to the next FOMC minutes or sometime like, you know, like Powell, I think everyone needs to understand that Jerome Powell is deathly afraid of a repeat of what happened in the seventies with Paul Volcker. 
And what they're really afraid of is them responding too quickly to um, uh, to inflation getting under control. If they start cutting and then they get a double top in inflation, then they're fucked. Like Paul Volcker had to take rates up to like 18% in order to, to combat that, that second hump. And Jerome Powell explicitly said, we know how to fix markets. Right. We know we know that we've got the tools at our disposal to fix them. So we want to err on the side of breaking markets by keeping rates higher for longer. And he actually explicitly said this like well, you know, the two FOMC minutes ago. He's like, we know exactly how to fix markets. So we want to err on the side of breaking them. So I think if people are being too optimistic about about you know Fed pivot right now, they're gonna to prepare to get their world hurt. The yeah. next time Jerome Powell opens his mouth, so I'm I'm cautiously optimistic, but I I am sort of like I think that I've seen I think that we've seen the bottom as I predicted on mm -hmm. our prediction show. I don't think that we're going to retrace much further back. But that being said, I'd, I'm I'd be cautious for people buying the whole like off the races, it's time to moon type of situation until you know the the Fed actually does you know. Put their money where their mouth is. I mean, that, so the, the dots for next year are still over 5%. I think it's 5.1. Like yeah. the 25% uh, 25 bit hike is pretty much all but priced in in Fed. Mm -hmm. I think there would be surprise if it was 50 now. Um, but they could still do that, right? It's still in line taking them to 5%. And then maybe the next one would be 25. But the issue is if people get too excited now, it actually makes their reason to hike even more because. Uh, the yield will come down and that's the exact opposite of what they're trying to do. Um, so yeah, it's a delicate balance. Uh, I think it's Carlos yeah. rightly put it. It's probably a bit early to be like, oh, we're, we're, we're definitely all done. And this is so, it. So Matt, what you're talking wrong. I like it. I like it when the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum goes up. <laughs> that makes me happy in many places. <laughs> but I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about where we stand with that. I mean, because... We, well, like, let's dive into the number just really quickly and look at the components that, and this isn't secret. This is exactly what Jerome Powell said. This is how I look at it. So they break up CPI into really three things. The first is goods, right? And so you're getting the price of goods going down, except for maybe eggs. Um, but there are some structural sort of like post-pandemic things that we're getting. Can I just ask that? Why is so special about No eggs fucking right idea. Although, I mean, okay. I like eggs. I, I'm, I feel like... I need to have Sorry. you guys over so I can cook you guys an omelet. I've, I've one of my pandemic guilty pleasures with learning how to make a nice French omelet. So uh, maybe Beautiful. I've been going overboard it's on that. I have no though. idea. My wife buys uh, these. Uh, like yeah, someone's like doing all right, offering out the eggs. Too. Yeah, yeah. Like my well, wife buys yeah. these, these eggs that are like you know seven dollars for a dozen. It's like some of these like they're, they're the, the higher the higher Bitcoin goes, the more the more generous I get with my uh, with eggs. my eggs, boys. <laughs> so, <laughs> only only the best range free organic. This chicken was named Fred, and we fucking love him. Eggs. Uh, so or purchased good. in the Zendejas household as, as long as Bitcoin's above 18,000. Um, <laughs> but brunch, anyway. at, brunch at Carlos is up. <laughs> exactly. So like, go goods are going down, but there's a very good reason for that. You know, like the supply chain is kind of cooling off. You've got China coming back online. There's a number of things that make goods kind of come down. Shelter is the other component that they look at, but that's sort of like a lagging indicator, right? Like the leases and people's like, you know, housing costs don't change very dynamically. So that, that can take six months to a year to really flow through the system. And that's the one portion of CPI that's still kind of high. And then you have what's called services X shelter. So that's what Jerome Powell says. I'm really fucking looking at. And if you look at like month over month, um, you know, expectations on that portion, we're pretty much down like the two and a half to 3% uh, range, which is a really good thing. And so I think it's, it stimulates that everything's kind of moving in the right direction, you know, and the only portion of, of CPI that looks not great is the shelter portion, but all the leading indicators for that, such as like lumber prices, new home starts suggest that that's going to come down shortly too. Um, the only thing that I think could cause like a real, uh, a real problem would be wages. Um, cause I think you kind of end up with this dual headed thing where it's like the, the wage inflation is not fully a cyclical thing. There is a secular trend in that in the sense that we're seeing the largest generation in the history of the United States, the baby boomers have all reached retirement age as of this year. 
And so you're seeing a lot of workforce come offline and there's not that many people to replace them comparatively. Like the millennials have already been in the workforce for the last decade, right? Gen X is not very large and Gen Z is also not very large. So when you have a massive amount of people come online, there's bound to be a little bit inflation. So that's the one thing that kind of scares me is you might have this like pesky wage inflation that kind of like kicks in because we're just not seeing a whole lot of workforce participation. And um, those are the numbers that have been the stickiest. If you look at like the economic releases that have been happening over the last little bit. Um, and so if that's what Powell's watching, they might keep it, keep the rates higher for longer. Um, because as previously stated, they'd rather err on the side of caution. So if they're not seeing exactly what they want, they're likely to sit around and keep them higher for longer. So, I mean, I guess I'm still cautiously optimistic. I like the fact that, and I predicted on the last thing that I think they'll end up pivoting H2, but I don't, I wouldn't price in anything immediate because I think they need, they still need to see some aspects of the economy break a little bit before they really go into full pivot mode. Yeah. You know, there's so many talking heads and there's so much news, like noise that comes out about this every every 10 minutes, it feels like. It's kind of interesting to look at overall overreaching trends and consensus around what the Fed is going to do, what it will inflation look like. And so it's kind of like, it's interesting to look at, if you look at like more like six month segments, like what was consensus view 12 months ago? Like what was consensus view six months ago? It feels like in general, like people thought that we were going to reach the peak of the Fed rate hiking cycle right around now, like Q4, Q1. I think the one thing, at least, and this is, uh, I think with the one thing that has changed, though, is how long the Fed is going to maintain those high interest rates where people might have been thinking they could do a, a abrupt turn and start cutting rates where that seems like a lot, a lot less likely. So I feel like that's really just like the one big change that we've seen. Um, in consensus views around around inflation and Fed Fed rate hikes. Yeah, I think my only piece of advice on that is um, the Fed has been wrong a lot, but they've shown that even when they're wrong, they generally tend to stick to their guns until they're forced <laughs> to not do so. No, seriously, like Jerome Powell has been pretty good about giving forward guidance and then doing that thing. Yeah. And the other secret weapon that I tell everyone that will listen is follow Nick Timorous on Twitter. So he's the staff economist at the New York Times. Uh, I'm fairly certain that the the Fed uses him as basically a way to test ideas um, for public perception before they actually release them. So they likely have a, a WhatsApp group or whatever secret version of WhatsApp they use at the government to be like, hey, this is what we're doing. You want to post a little something, something, plus an opinion piece on the Wall Street Journal and see, see how, how the market tweeted. reacts. Yeah. How, how yeah. Many I mean, it's, it's a time order it. management management practice. I know like, for example, when we were at Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank would very, very, very frequently release. Um, it's like, hey, we're planning on doing this thing and then seeing how the market reacted to the stock price to see if it was a good idea to do that thing. Um, you know, so it's it did not surprised me that, that that's what the Fed is actually doing right now. But seriously, I mean, listening to Jerome Powell himself, is probably the best thing you can do. And the second best thing you can do is to follow Nick Timorous on Twitter. I need to. I, I I don't think I follow him. I mostly just follow yeah. you know Beyonce and uh, some of the former I mean, Spice Girls. You, you got you got to be well rounded. Yeah, true. true. Lord true. Lord knows I love me some ginger spice. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, folks, at the DJ Cast. <laughs> That's like <laughs> totally wrong Spice Girl. It's a posh all the way. <laughs> sporty Spice. I was always into Sporty Spice back in the day. That was, that was my job. Uh, was what the, do you uh Huh? No. Matt, I was about, about you? to ask, like, over, over, over on, on the other side of the pond, who is the, uh, who is the it girl? Yeah. Uh, baby. I think Baby was the one. Baby Spice. All right. Into Blondes. Right. Okay. Classic. Into Blondes. All right. I buy yeah. it. Yeah, so funny, guys. Yeah, with the, with the rest of the time, do you guys want to touch on a different topic? Um, Chat GPT. I know they've been raising money at a pretty high valuation. Um, I'm not a whole. I'm not a. I'm not, I don't even pretend to be a specialist in generative AI. AI. Um, <laughs> Matt and Carlos, you guys only are, pretend to be a, a yeah. little, little expert. There, there are other things I pretend to be, but not. <laughs> but that is not one of them. So I don't know if you guys want to want to touch on that. I thought that was kind of interesting, though. It seems like a pretty high valuation. Yeah, so the uh, GPT model came out of uh, the OpenAI team, I think, three, four years ago. 
Um, I remember when it when it came out, it's like this is the end of the world. This thing is going to be you know, spamming everyone, and uh, it's the, the end of uh, pronunciation as we know it, uh, the English language. So basically, it's a, it's a natural language processing model. Um, they've had several iterations of it now. I think they're going to release the fourth version. The third one is out, uh, or three point five, I think. Um, it is basically a huge transform model that has like billions of parameters in it. Like you can't fit this thing generally into memory on a normal computer. You have to distribute it in order to train it. And it's trained on large corpuses of text that can be anything from stuff on the internet or whatever else they've scraped through. Uh, I forget exactly. A lot of it's like Wikipedia as well, things like this. Um, and as a result, they get pretty good you know, you can ask it something and it can give you something back. Um, it, it can generate a sequence of, t of uh, words that are related to something that you're interested in. Um, and so what they did for chat GPT is they added like a reinforcement learning component such that it could get better at responding to prompts to give more so can you, accurate information. Matt, can you, can you just outline what the difference is between like a traditional you know, uh, supervised learning problem and a reinforcement learning problem. Yeah. So, a uh, supervised learning problem is you, you know, the output, uh, up front. So you have something that you want to train against that could be uh, ones and zeros, trues or falses. Like is the market going to go up or down? And then you have a data set and you're training that data set to best predict whether the market's going up or down. Um, reinforcement learning will be an expected return. So it's generally some kind of forward path or sequence of events. And you train your model to iterate, to take actions that then lead to better and higher rewards in the future. Uh, and it's different because um, you don't kind of have that decay of rewards that you have um, in a classical a supervised learning problem. And that's the distinction. So supervised learning, you know, all the labels and everything up front, and then you're trying to fit that as best you can. Whereas in a reward environment, you have a, an action and a state, and then you choose actions. Uh, and then you see, you have a feedback mechanism. Yeah. So the way, the way I think about this, um, it's actually kind of cool. Cause now that I have a toddler, um, I, I, I put reinforcement learning sometimes into the view of like how a toddler learns. So, uh, think about like, no, seriously, like, it's actually kind of, kind of fascinating. So imagine, uh, as, as a, for instance, our, our son, Jack, like we'd like to teach him how to eat with a spoon, right? So, um, if you just put a spoon into a toddler's hand without any context, like it doesn't know what to do with it. So you kind of need to, you know, give it some guidance. <laughs> Um, and the way that a toddler learns is it says, all right, I have a state of the world and the state of the world that I can see right now is that I have food on a plate in front of me and I have a spoon in my hand and I can take an action, right? So given the state of the world, I can take some action, meaning I can move my arm any way that I want to, and I can do something with this spoon. Um, I just don't know what to do with it. And the only thing that I will say is that I have a reward. So that reward might be that I've got, I don't know, like PB and J in front of me. I'm not PB, like applesauce, because toddlers fucking love applesauce. And so they want the applesauce in their mouth, but right now it's on the plate and they have a spoon in their hand. And without knowing any preconditioned way of mapping it, right, the way that they understand how to do it is by just randomly trying shit. So if you've ever seen a toddler eat and try and use a spoon, it's actually absurd because like they'll, they'll poke it. They'll like do stuff. If they do happen to get something on there, you know, they'll flick it across the room <laughs> or like Jack does this amazing thing where he'll, he'll put it on the spoon and just as he gets it to his mouth, he'll turn it. So it goes upside down and just in between before it gets to his mouth, all the shit just falls straight onto his lap. Um, <laughs> And so like the part of the reinforcement learning process is to say like, there's no clear cut answer. Like no one, no one tells you exactly what to do. The only thing that you can do is you can try a bunch of random shit over and over and over again until you get closer and closer and closer to maximizing your reward. And so over time, the toddler will go from like randomly flailing around. So once it gets more experienced, you know, observing the state of the world and like taking some action, it will 
you know, put the spoon in and eventually it'll actually get to its mouth in the proper way. But it needs a lot of experience to go back and forth. But basically saying, all right, I, here's the state of the world. What action did I take? Um, what's the reward? I got zero reward because it flicked the fucking like applesauce on the other side of the room. And there's none in my mouth. And the older it gets and the more experience it gets, uh, the better it gets. So with like chat GPT, if you can imagine, they're trying to do well at one thing, which is generating text given some response. So you type in something and at first chat GPT is going to like tell you, you know, some gobbledygook. It'll be some random assortment of letters, you know, with no coherence at all. And if you train that model for billions and billions and billions of human hours, but distributed across, you know, thousands and thousands of computers, um, it slowly learns how to do shit. And the more access to data you have, and the more money you can spend to have these computers rolling, like literally rolling for like days and days and days and months and months and months, Ooh. perpetually learning by doing random shit and trying it out, <laughs> it'll eventually stumble on the right answer, provided that you have enough time and compute power dedicated to the problem. So that's the really cool thing. And this is one of the things that's somewhat interesting about ChatGPT is that they've raised like $10 billion from Microsoft. Hmm. And it's because at the end of the day, if you look at the people that have the resources to really train a model like GPT-3 and soon to be GPT-4, what do you need to do this defensively? Well, you need access to a shitload of data. Um, you also need access to a ton of compute time. And you need a lot of patience and a lot of skill to get these models to converge because you kind of need to know the ins and outs of how to point them in the right direction. Um, Otherwise they end up just doing random shit and they never actually learn how to do stuff. So that, that skill set plus that capital outlay to get access to data and give that access to the compute time that's needed to do this. It's really expensive. It's really time consuming, but when you get it right instead of jet chat GPT, it's really powerful. It's also scalable, right? I mean, it's like, it can be scale. It's tech, right? So it can be, it might be expensive, but then like the use cases, anyone with a, well, Computer that's a good point. Internet the, connection. Use, the use cases are like some of the stuff that you can ask it are pretty insane. Uh, yeah. already <laughs> like, you were playing like, with I, it quite a bit, Carlos, or something. Yeah, no, I wrote, I wrote Christmas letters with, uh, with chat GPT. So, so uh, give, um, give me some context. So like, what do you say? Be like, dear grandma. And then it writes like, thank you for the, you know, toy when I was eight. like, how, what, do you oh, so here's the best thing you can, you can give it, let's say for example, I was writing, you know, a, a Christmas letter to Rob Ridzak and family. I would say chat GPT, uh, write a Christmas letter to my friend, Rob Ridzak and his wife. Uh, make sure to congratulate him on having twins this year. Thank him for his good friendship in, you know, making sure that I always had a drinking buddy in New York City when I got stuck near Bryant Park and tell him that I wish the best for his family. So as long as you know how to prompt it, right? Like if I, if I were to give you a, a Christmas card that was like, um, Rob and family, thanks, bullet point, awesome beers, bullet point. <laughs> congrats on twins. It'd be kind of a shitty Christmas card, but you give that skeleton to chat GPT and it pops out with a couple paragraphs of well-written prose. It's fantastic. Yeah. So my, okay. my, my view on chat GPT, and I've actually used this for programming stuff as well. It's like, I view it as the same level of intelligence as a first year grad out of an undergrad program, right? Like a first year grad of an undergrad program, you give them a programming task or a writing task. They're generally going to Google some shit and then put it together with a little bit of context. And then your job as a manager is to understand where it's wrong and give them some guidance. And then maybe in a couple hours, they'll come back with something a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So I think chat GPT has this amazing thing because it's like having a first year analyst. You can tell it to do something. It will effectively Google it because that's, it's learned off of public data. It will spit something back to you and your job is to review it and understand where it's wrong. And then you can, you can actually write back to it be like, Oh yeah, I actually like this, but can you please change this one thing? And it will go back and fix it and give you a better output. Yeah. So, that, that's the cool, one of the cool things is that, that back and forth with it. I, I, wow. I asked it, um, why is there more matter in the universe than antimatter? And it came up with something a bit boring but you know accurate and then i said okay now tell me that in the style of the dude from the big lebowski and it, <laughs> it, and it was like hey man so dude you know <laughs> and then at the end it's like enough said 
Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's yeah. hilarious. But so that's, I mean, that's, it's incredible. I mean, people have been talking about computer programs replacing jobs. And so far we've seen it, you know, well, we see, you know, McDonald's has the automated kiosks now and CVS and some of these other places you have these uh, self checkouts. Um, but we're starting to see stuff impacting, like you mentioned, like for, see, those are like white collar, those are like white collar skills, like ed- typically educated, well-educated skills. And, um, we're starting to see them possibly being automated, which is, uh, which is incredible. Yeah. You know, I think that there's going to be some really useful applications, not, not, not just chat GPT, but if you think of like what chat GPT does, right. It takes sequence modeling of words into other, you know, words. Um, but you can use the exact same technology to do things like, Hey, here's a sequence of market data, um, predict what's going to happen in the future. Or even better, like imagine if you could say, um, what if you could shift it to say, well, here's a sequence of market data. Don't predict to me what direction the market's going to go. Tell me what to do. Because like if when you're trading, what you find is sometimes uh, you could actually be right with alpha, but you cannot make money because they're like, let's say, for example, the market's moving really fast and you're right but there's no way for you to act on that in a timely way. Or um, there's a lot of orders that are currently in the order book that have to get filled before you do. So like, let's say you're right, but by the time you get filled, the market's already moved and you're just not making money. What if you could correlate not only just predictions of what the market's going to do, but also say, this is what the market's going to do. And given the state of the market and our prediction of what it's going to do, What do we actually think is the best way to monetize this and make money? So there's some really fascinating things that I think are just getting started right now. I think that the the only problem that you have is that uh, language models and computer vision models are actually reasonably static. Meaning um, if I fed a picture of a dog or a hot dog or a pizza to a deep learning model, uh, that's reasonably constant over time. Like dogs are going to look like dogs. So you train the model once and you generally know if something's a dog or not, or the English language has some drift, but not a lot over time. So if I spend $10 million to train a massive chat GPT model, well, generally speaking, it's not like in six months time, it's not going to decay and the language won't change as much that I need to retrain it again. Versus in markets, you can have regime shifts. So it's, it's more difficult. So I think finding that balance of, you know, how can I have a model that is, uh, adaptive enough to market conditions, but also, you know, learns a lot from the history of markets and has the ability to look over long sequences of data and predict not only a prediction of the market, but also give you an action that might lead to a better monetization is something that's just really, really powerful. I'm waiting it's for you a... to stop talking in case you end up saying more about what a business No, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and this is how we do it, by the way. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's great, guys. Appreciate the explanation. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, if you want to know how we do it, you have to buy me dinner first, Matt. So, oh, so yeah. I, I, I demand, Rob I demand a case. <laughs> I, I demand at least a case of fantastic, <laughs> of fantastic, high quality eggs. Matt, I mean, when when Carlos asks to go out for dinner, that's basically like pizza and, and a beer. So it's pretty. See, Carlos is a cheap date. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cheap. I'm a cheap date. <laughs> Oh, guys. Awesome. Hey, um, thank you so much for, for jumping on. It was great to talk. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation, especially around HFTs, um, and chat GBT. That was great. Thanks so much for joining. Cheers guys. Yeah. Cheers guys. Have a good one. See ya. Bye. Enjoy.